Number five. When 24-year-old footballer Daniel Correa Freitas joined the throng of family and friends celebrating the 18th birthday of a friend, he had little idea of the horror that lay in store. A champagne-fueled evening in a local nightclub had culminated early in the morning at an impromptu party at the family home of Alana Brits. It was here at 8 a.m. that Daniel sent a series of selfies on WhatsApp showing him lying in bed alongside Alana's mother, Christiana. I'm going to devour the birthday girl's mom, and the dad is here, a grinning Daniel wrote to friends. One replied, That guy is going to beat you up. Little could the friend have known the extent to which this casual, jocular prediction would come true. Just hours after that exchange, Daniel was dead, his body dumped in bushes in a nearby town. He had been castrated and nearly decapitated. Three days after Daniel's body was found, Alana's father, Edison Brits Jr., 38, a well-known businessman, admitted to killing him, claiming it was a revenge attack after finding Daniel attempting to rape his wife, Christiana. But according to toxicology reports, showed that the amount of alcohol in Daniel's bloodstream would have rendered him very drunk and probably incapable of sexual assault. And while Edison insisted he acted alone, the Medical Legal Institute, IML, report indicated that Daniel's body was carried by more than one person to the place where it was found. Dorsal, thoracic, and high injuries from Daniel's body point out that at least two people carried the player to the area. Cobb said they also do not believe Daniel raped or attempted to rape Christiana, whose younger daughter, age 12, is now being cared for by neighbors. Before being killed, Daniel had partied with the family at a nightclub in Curitiba on October 26, 2018, at the birthday celebrations. He had then reportedly been invited to continue the festivities into the following day at the family's house. It is reported that only 20 people were invited. The party eventually ended in the early hours of the 27th. At some point after 8 a.m., Daniel sent a series of WhatsApp messages to friends in which he claimed he was about to have sex with Alana's mother, Christiana. Accompanied by a selfie showing him lying in bed alongside either a sleeping or possibly unconscious Christiana, still wearing the dress she wore to the party, the grinning footballer wrote, I can sleep here. There are several women sleeping all over the house. In a subsequent message, he took things further. I'm going to devour the birthday girl's mom and the dad is here. An unnamed friend and an ominous warning responded, Is he asleep? Nothing you can do then. They're going to kick you out of the house. Another added, They're going to make mincemeat of you. That guy is going to come and beat you up. He followed it up with another message 10 minutes later, which read simply, I ate her. He was found dead by passersby, practically beheaded with severed genitals hours later. A forensic report by Piranha Scientific Police and the IML said the cause of the death was a stab to the neck with an extremely sharp implement, which exposed the victim's cervical spine. IML Chief Paulino Pastre told local media the investigation revealed that while Daniel's penis was most likely cut off after he was stabbed, it is not possible to specify the exact moment when this occurred. Daniel's genitals were recovered from a tree where it had allegedly been tossed. Investigators went to check the Brits' home and found traces of blood spatter on the walls and floor of the couple's bedroom, suggesting Daniel was beaten while still in the master bedroom. There were blood stains in the garage and in Edison's car and signs that attempts may have been made to clean up the evidence. Experts confirmed the bedroom door had been broken, but they could not determine when this happened. Edison initially said in his TV confession, he had busted open the door with his shoulder. But during police questioning, he changed his story, claiming he had entered through the window. According to Edison, he had put Daniel's body in the boot of the car. He insisted that while his friends had helped him take him out of the house, they had tried to stop him from committing the crime. But they could not do it, Brits insisted. Seven people had been arrested on suspicion of being involved in the murder. According to cops, Eduardo da Silva, 19, Yegor King, 19, 
Eduardo Percote, 18, and David William, 18, participated in brutalizing and torturing the player. They were allegedly in the car that took the athlete to his death in the forest. Police arrested Christiana and Alana after concluding that they had tried to persuade witnesses to cover up the murder. Prosecutor Yao Milton Salles said to Globo TV, Following the analysis of the investigation, the conclusion I reached was that this homicide would never have happened the way it did without the decisive performance of Christiana. Christiana, 35, allegedly led the player to believe that the joke of taking a picture next to her would be harmless. Salas continued, Christiana knew the character of her husband and his violent personality. When the murderous acts that culminated in Daniel's death began, we believe she didn't try to prevent his execution. And according to police chief Amado Travesin, it is likely Daniel just lay next to the bed and took the picture and posted the pics to a WhatsApp group in an immature stunt. Number four. The students in this selfie were from Besling College of the Philippines in Quezon City. They were on a field trip and were only just a few minutes from reaching their destination, a recreation camp in Tanay Rizal. Some of the students in the photo would eventually lose their lives. On February 20, 2017, at around 8.45 a.m., a tourist bus with plate number TXS-325 was traveling along Sitio Bayocan, Barangay Sampaloc in Tanay Rizal when the bus allegedly lost its brake and bumped into an electric post. The impact was so strong that even a big part of the bus's roof has been almost removed. The accident took place in a blind curve in Magnetic Hill near Pellegrino Farm. Sixteen people died, including the driver, a staff, and 14 students. Twenty others were hurt in this accident. The tourist bus was totally wrecked, especially on its left side. According to witnesses who first arrived at the scene, said, There were countless bodies in the site, some barely breathing, others beyond recognition. The responders mustered enough presence of mind to bring the wounded immediately to the hospital and to retrieve the dead with dignity. Around 50 passengers, all students from Besling College of the Philippines, were bound for a camping activity at Sacramento Adventure Camp in Tanay, according to Berlito Beite Jr., training officer of the Tanay MDRRMC. But before the tragic bus accident happens, students were all happy and excited on this trip. They took pictures inside the bus not knowing a tragic accident will happen to them while on their way to a camping activity. Some of the students who survived the incident have opened up about the tragedy. One of the survivors revealed that the bus driver apologized to them after realizing that the brakes had failed. We were screaming because the bus driver said that the brakes had failed. He was saying sorry to us. He said, sorry, the brakes failed. And then we stood up, screamed while others prayed. Another survivor said that they heard an unfamiliar sound after the driver tried to hit the brakes. Those of us who were at the back held on and repeatedly made the sign of the cross. We prayed and entrusted everything unto God. One of the survivors also talked about noticing a smell of burning rubber and feeling some heat coming from the bus floorboard before the accident. Parents of the college students who perished in the accident were furious and expressed regrets they signed the school waivers for their students to join the field trip as a National Service Training Program, NSTP, and graduation requirement. Number three. This disturbing message that had been spray painted on the dead end road in Utica named Poe Street was where 17-year-old Bianca Debbins believed to be murdered on early Sunday, July 14, 2019. The chilling message was written by her killer, 21-year-old Brandon Andrew Clark. When police arrived at the scene, they noticed the message and found Bianca's body outside an SUV belonging to Brandon not far away from the message he left. Bianca was from Utica, New York, who has been referred to as an e-girl a demographic of teen whom BuzzFeed News describes as a new kind of cool girl who tends to spend time on the social media platforms TikTok and Discord. E-Girl is also known as a blend gamer culture with emo aesthetics. Bianca had a small following on Instagram under the handle at EskT, which since her death has amassed a following of more than 100,000. She also used to post regularly on Discord as well as on 4chan. 
Bianca had recently graduated from T.R. Proctor High School and was set to attend Mohawk Valley Community College, where she planned to study psychology. Ultimately, she wanted to help adolescents with mental health issues as she struggled with them herself. In the early hours of Sunday, July 14th, morning, photos began to circulate on social media channels, including Instagram, Discord, and 4chan, graphically depicting the murder of Bianca. The images, captured by her alleged killer Brandon Andrew Clark, showed Bianca with her throat slit in the passenger seat of a car. According to Utica police, Bianca and Brandon had just attended a concert together and were in a relationship. Police said that the two had met on Instagram two months ago and used the photo sharing service as their primary source of communication, but they had met in person on several occasions and knew each other's family. After the attack, Brandon allegedly logged on to Discord under his username, Apparatia, and posted a photo of Bianca's body, writing, Sorry fuckers, you're going to have to find somebody else to orbit. The phrase, find somebody else to orbit, is a reference to the men's rights movement and its red pill theory's concept of beta orbiter, which describes low-value men who closely follow the social media presence of someone with whom they hope to have a sexual or romantic relationship. According to one of Bianca's friends, Chels, who met her on Discord three years ago, said that on Saturday night, Bianca and Brandon traveled to New York City to see a concert by Nicole Dulleganger. Once they arrived at the venue, they allegedly met up and smoked weed with another man in Brandon's car. Then, around 10 p.m., Brandon and Bianca started their drive back to Utica, Chell said. But at some point during the night, the two allegedly got into a dispute. In DMs that Bianca sent to a different friend on Discord, Bianca said Brandon was so mad that she held hands and kissed the unidentified third man at the concert. Her last message was sent at 5.47 a.m. local time. Around 6.40 a.m., photos of Bianca's partially decapitated body showed up on 4chan and the Instagram story of user at YesJuliet, which is believed to belong to Brandon. The user then shared a video on his Instagram story of him driving down a dark road with the caption, Here comes hell, it's redemption, right? And changed his bio to 10 1997 to 71419. Just know that I feel no pain now. On Bianca's Discord server, Brandon also reportedly posted a photo of Bianca with her throat slit. Another user notices the date of the image, the hair color, and eyeliner and asks where the picture came from. Brandon responds, My fucking car. I fuck Bianca's dumb ass. Anyways, remember to subscribe to PewDiePie, also to the faggot fuck Alex with the Chinese username. Hope it was worth it. She was going to go home today. In another comment, Brandon identifies her as Bianca Michelle Devins of Utica, New York. Brandon ends the message by saying, Should be a few articles within days. Have fun. Brandon was possibly an admin of the Facebook page Dark Cell Gaming. The page posted an image from Brandon's Instagram with a caption that read, This may be my final post, they're coming for me, and I have done something very, very terrible, I am sorry. Another member of the Discord server followed Brandon on Snapchat and used his Snap Maps location to alert the police after seeing the photo of Bianca's body. Utica Police Department officials stated that the station received calls from multiple 4chan and Discord users and said Brandon himself called 911. When officers arrived at the scene, Brandon began stabbing himself in the neck before taking a selfie with Bianca's body. He was rushed to the hospital and survived. Brandon was then charged with second-degree murder, a Class A-1 felony punishable by up to 25 years to life in state prison. As news of the attack reached the press, hysteria ensued and a variety of conflicting stories began to surface. On social media, many painted Brandon as a lonely, obsessed fan who had stalked Evans and tracked her down at a concert then killed her after she sexually rejected him. This narrative prompted the hashtag R.I.P. Bianca, which went viral, with many claiming the tragedy was an all-too-familiar story for women who are often terrified of rejecting men for fear of inciting their rage. On forums like 4chan, however, a thread featuring images of a deceased Bianca features posts from users joking about the photos and blaming her for her own murder for flirting with male followers online 
referring to Brandon in the same context as UC Santa Barbara shooter and incel hero Elliot Roger. According to some 4chan users, Bianca had a mental issue and that she used to mentally abuse and manipulate men and showed screen caps of her conversations with some of the men she talked with. Several purported screenshots of texts between her and Brandon surfaced. They even posted some screen caps suggesting Bianca sold nudes to support her drug habit. Now even if this is true or not, Bianca didn't deserve to be murdered. Nobody deserves to be murdered at all. Bianca was very young when she died and she had her whole life ahead of her. Number 2 The sadness in the eyes of this girl, wearing a robe and a veil, is showing. This photo was taken at a party in Salt Lake City in September 2002. The girl is Elizabeth Smart. She was taken at the party with her abductor Brian David Mitchell, the man with a bushy beard, who can be seen at the far right in this picture. Mitchell's accomplice and wife Wanda Barzi was also at the party. In the early hours on June 5, 2002, Elizabeth Smart, then 14 years old, was taken at knife point from her bedroom in her parents' house in the upscale Federal Heights neighborhood of Salt Lake City. Mitchell slid into the house undetected and came to the bedroom that Elizabeth shared with her nine-year-old sister, Mary Catherine. He was able to get inside the house by cutting open the screen of an open window. Elizabeth's younger sister, Mary Catherine, was the only witness to the kidnapping. She watched the abduction while pretending to be asleep and did not inform her parents until two hours after the incident, frightened that the man might return for her if she called out to alert them. Although Mitchell spoke to Elizabeth quietly, Mary Catherine thought Mitchell's voice seemed somewhat familiar, but she couldn't pinpoint where or when she had heard it. I thought, you know, be quiet because if he hears you, he might take you too, and you're the only person who has seen this. I was like shaking, she later confessed in an interview. She also adds that when Elizabeth said, ouch, after stubbing her toe on a chair, Mitchell said something that sounded like, you better be quiet and I won't hurt you. The next day, Elizabeth's parents went on television and asked the kidnapper to return their daughter. A massive search for Elizabeth began. Volunteers combed the hills near her family's home and extended the search using search dogs and aircraft. After many days of intensive searching, the community-led search was closed by the local volunteers and efforts were directed to other means of finding Elizabeth. Elizabeth was taken to a crude campsite in the woods just three miles from her family's home, close enough that she could hear the voices of searchers calling for her in the days following her abduction. The location of the campsite was very remote and well hidden. Investigators believe Brian David Mitchell built it in anticipation of Elizabeth's arrival. Although police had an eyewitness Mary Catherine, her report was not very helpful to investigators. Furthermore, there was almost no significant forensic evidence such as clear fingerprints or DNA samples to help identify the abductor, hindering the investigation. Police questioned and interviewed hundreds of potential suspects, including one individual, Brett Michael Edmonds, a 26-year-old who was pursued across the country but ultimately was cleared of suspicion in the case after being located in a West Virginia hospital. Then police focused on another suspect, Richard Ritchie, who had once worked as a handyman in the smart home. Serving time in prison for a parole violation during the investigation, Ritchie denied having any involvement in the kidnapping. The trail grew cold after Ritchie died in prison of a brain hemorrhage on August 30th. After several months, a breakthrough came in October 2002, when Mary Catherine suddenly remembered where she had heard Mitchell's voice, telling her parents, I think I know who it is, Emmanuel. Another former worker at the Smart Home, who called himself Emmanuel, might be Elizabeth's captor and the Smarts relayed the information to authorities. On February 3rd, believing that the police were not taking Mary Catherine's tip seriously, the Smart family called their own press conference to release a sketch of Emmanuel to the media with the assistance of John Walsh, who revealed it in an appearance on Larry King Live and on his own series, America's Most Wanted. Several days later, a man contacted police to inform them that Emmanuel was his disturbed stepfather, Brian David Mitchell, and that he believed him to indeed be capable of kidnapping. 
In the days before finding Elizabeth, the Smarts continued to criticize police for failing to devote enough energy to following up on the lead. On March 12, 2003, just over nine months after the abduction, Mitchell, who was now wanted by police for questioning, was spotted with two people in Sandy, Utah, by a couple who had seen photos on the news and called 911. The people were Elizabeth Smart, disguised in a gray wig, sunglasses, and veil, and Wanda Eileen Barzi. Elizabeth was finally recognized by the officers during questioning and was promptly reunited with her family. Mitchell and Barzi were taken into custody as alleged kidnappers. According to Elizabeth's October 1, 2009 U.S. federal court testimony, after she had gone to bed on June 4, 2002, a man Elizabeth identified as Brian Mitchell had entered her bedroom and had placed his hand on my chest and then put the knife up to my neck. He told me to get up quietly, and if I didn't, then he would kill me and my family. After Elizabeth had been led to Mitchell's camp in the woods, a woman she identified as Wanda Barzi eventually just proceeded to wash my feet and told me to change out of my pajamas into a robe type of garment. And when I refused, she said if I didn't, she would have Brian Mitchell come rip my pajamas off. I put the robe on. He came and performed a ceremony, which was to marry me to him. After that, he proceeded to rape me. Elizabeth told him that she hadn't even started her period yet, and Mitchell asked Barzi if that was a problem. She said no, and he raped her. Elizabeth has said that, afterward, she didn't feel like a whole person anymore. She felt dirty and broken. She asked herself, who would ever love me? She even wondered if her family would want her back. It was later revealed during court testimony that Brian Mitchell repeatedly raped Elizabeth multiple times daily. For the first three months, he chained her ankle to a cable strung between two trees. He warned her not to talk about her family and declared that she could no longer call herself Elizabeth. She was Sheer Jashub now. Mitchell and Barzi had sex in front of her, and he made Elizabeth look at pornography and drink alcohol, telling her that she had to descend to the depths before she could rise and become pure again. She was often desperately hungry and thirsty, since they were dependent on what Mitchell called plunder, groceries that he shoplifted during treks to the city. After three months of being shackled, Elizabeth's ordeal took a still stranger turn. Mitchell and Barzi decided to bring her along with them to their trips to the city. She was forced to wear a wig and dress in a robe and veil to conceal her identity. They even ended up at a party where Mitchell, in a robe and sandals, spent half the time preaching against sin and the rest drinking absinthe. They also took a bus, shopped at grocery stores, and spent time in parks. Nobody recognized her. Elizabeth said she felt so dirty and so filthy after she was raped by her captor and she understands why somebody wouldn't run because of that alone. She spoke at a John Hopkins Human Trafficking Forum, saying she was raised in a religious household and recalled a school teacher who spoke once about abstinence and compared sex to chewing gum. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm that chewed up piece of gum. Nobody re-chews a piece of gum, you throw it away. And that's how easy it is to feel like you no longer have worth, you no longer have value, Elizabeth said. Why would it even be worth screaming out? Why would it even make a difference if you are rescued? Your life still has no value. Number one. In this photo, made on May 22, 2019, a long queue of mountain climbers line a path on Mount Everest. The photo may look spectacular, but this would mostly end in disaster as this next photo taken by a Canadian adventure filmmaker shows a queue of Everest climbers traversing around a dead body. Adventure filmmaker Elia Sakali posted a series of images to social media to show the chaos that unfolded during the mountain's infamous deadly season over the past fortnight. Mr. Sakali said he cannot believe what I saw up there. Death, carnage, chaos, lineups, dead bodies on the route and intense at Camp 4. People who I tried to turn back who ended up dying. People being dragged down, walking over bodies, he wrote. Everything you read in the sensational headlines all played out on our summit night. He went on to describe the horror of watching climbers step over a dead body. The early morning light had revealed the gateway to the summit of Everest and in parallel a human being who had lost his life. 
Here we all were, chasing a dream, and beneath our very feet there was a lifeless soul. Is this what Everest has become? Eleven people have died in less than two weeks after poor weather cut the climbing window short, leaving mountaineers waiting in long queues to the summit, risking exhaustion and running out of oxygen. At least four of the deaths have been blamed on overcrowding, with teams sometimes waiting for hours in the death zone, where the cold is bitter, the air dangerously thin, and the terrain treacherous. The crowding was also laid bare in a photo taken by Nirmal Purja, a former Gurkha soldier, of a long queue of climbers snaking up to the summit. The last confirmed death at that time was that of American climber Christopher John Coolish, 62, who died shortly after getting to the top of Mount Everest. Reports said Mr. Coolish, a lawyer, died at a camp below the summit during his descent. Most are believed to have suffered from altitude sickness, which is caused by low amounts of oxygen at high elevation and can cause headaches, vomiting, shortness of breath, and mental confusion. The dead included four climbers from India and two from the United States, and one each from Britain and Nepal. An Irish mountaineer is presumed dead after he slipped and fell close to the summit. Another Austrian and an Irish climber died on the northern Tibet side. One of the Indians who died on the Nepal side, 27-year-old Nawal Bhagwan, had to wait for more than 12 hours and died on his way back from the summit. American Donald Lynn Cash, 55, collapsed at the summit as he was taking photographs, while Anjali Kulkarni, also 55, died while descending after reaching the top. Kulkarni's expedition organizer, Aaron Trex, said heavy traffic at the summit had delayed her descent and caused the tragedy.